We turn our hearts now to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Listen for God's word. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. The word of the Lord. Chariots of Fire is a 1981 British historical drama film. It features two athletes in the 1924 Olympics. Eric Little, often mispronounced as Liddell, a devout Scottish Christian who runs for the glory of God, and Harold Abrahams, who's uh, an English Jew, who runs to overcome prejudice. Now almost 40 years old, the movie remains a compelling testimony of God's blessing the faithful use of our gifts and our talents. There's a, there's a scene in the movie, and you, you probably know it. You may have seen this movie several times. Maybe you don't know the movie at all. At one point in the movie, Eric Liddell, uh, Little is discussing his love of running with uh, his sister Jenny. And she's concerned that his athletic endeavors are adversely impacting his call to ministry. Contrasting his own sense of purpose to serve with his love of running, he says to his sister, I believe that God made me for a purpose. And he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. That has always stayed with me all these years, ever since I saw the movie the first time. And it, I realize that when we use our gifts for God's purposes, we feel God's pleasure too. Eric Little was meant to run. He was made for it. We've been made, and we've made, made, made new in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians, to give. It's how we're wired. It's what God is asking of us all the time as Christians to give back a small portion of that which already belongs to God. If you have much, God requires much. If you have little, God still requires that you be a good steward with the little that you've been given. And the good news is this, we can all give something of our time, talent, and treasure. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians that God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, we've heard this expression a lot. And when you think of a, a cheerful giver, who's the person that comes into your mind? Who is it? Who's that cheerful giver? I think a lot of us want to grow more into this identity. We long to become cheerful givers. Some of us are already there. Others of us, this is going to take a little while. But when we hear God loves a cheerful giver, we also can believe that God supplies the grace for us to achieve the very thing that God loves. And God loves it when we give freely to others. Now, as a kid, I can remember uh, going to church and, um, well, I don't know what it was like for Pastor Larry, but as a, as a kid, I was always making pa paper airplanes with my order of worship. I wasn't necessarily paying attention to the sermon. But I do know this, there were many sermons on the subject of giving. And while I can't recall all of the details, my life was primarily shaped and influenced by my own family's big-heartedness. Over the years, my parents and my grandparents, now all with the Lord, were generous, and their generosity had a profound impact on my life. They were at church all the time. They were okay with writing big checks. They were okay with giving a little extra when the church was in need or someone else had a felt need. This is true even for us today. 
now all of our grandparents are in heaven, but on both sides of the Pierce family, we can look to our parents, Dave and Terry, and Arlen and Marcia, as we see that example of generosity played out week to week. Had a conversation with a central member just this week who was talking about a very successful business leader in Grand Rapids who used to always say to his teams and to other leaders, generosity is taught at a young age. It is something that is taught. And if I've learned to be a cheerful giver, it is because of my family's example. And if my children are going to become cheerful givers, it will be because of our example. And this is a responsibility that my wife Monica and I do not take lightly. We want our children to be raised as Christ followers who become compassionate, caring, and generous. And the good news is we don't do it alone. I mean, I can look out here and I, I know many of you really well now and I know how you're wired and I know your commitment to Christ. And so we take great comfort in the fact that we will be raising our children in this incredible faith community who will together help us shape our own children into Christ's likeness. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? I mean, if you look back to the summer series on the book of Romans that we did, we spent many weeks in Romans. And what did we hear? That we are daily being conformed into the image and likeness of God's Son. We talked a lot about this spiritual journey, which involves spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. We talked about how Jesus is actually the greatest example of a cheerful giver. We know that because in 1 John 4, it says we love because God first loved us. And so when the apostle exhorts the Corinthian church to support their impoverished brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who had a real need, he turns to Jesus' example saying later in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. We're not talking about cash here. We're not talking about winning the Powerball or the Mega Millions. We are talking about something far more exciting and sustaining. Theologian John Calvin would later expand this thought in his Institutes in the Christian Religion when he would say, since we have such a great storehouse of riches in Christ, let us drink our fill. This past week, I received a note from Central's own Marva Lamberts. And you know, anytime you get a note from somebody like a Marva Lamberts, it's like getting a, a note from heaven. It really is. It's right here. And if there's anyone who knows just how blessed she is in the Lord, it would be Marva. And if there's anyone close to God, we know it would be Marva. Not because of her age, but because of her deep faith in Christ. I sent her a letter to congratulate her on her 100th birthday this past Thursday. And in true Marva fashion, she wrote back to me. And I have her permission to share a few words here. Dear Pastor Steve, my sincere thanks for your kind note and wishes on this 100th year birthday, November 12th. Surely every day is a gift. I give thanks to the chief shepherd whose love sought me, whose sacrificial blood bought me, and whose amazing grace brought me to the fold. Yes, wondrous grace. And for the blessed Holy Spirit who indwells us, teaches us, leads us, comforts and imparts his grace to us as we trust. Each day, she says, brings me closer to faith's vision, which is eternal. 
Marva writes as someone who's grateful because she knows how much God has done for her and continues to do for her. She's a cheerful giver. She has been for many years. And God loves a cheerful giver. Because those who feel pleasure in giving, whether it be their time, their talent, their treasure, or all three, display the glorious grace of God's Son working in and through them. Author James Harvey puts it this way. He says, His grace abounds to us in giving because the act of giving, in the act of giving, we are being moved toward the image of Christ. Every time we give to God's kingdom work, we can know a joy and peace in entrusting ourselves to the grace of our Father and being moved by grace toward the image of his Son. And then he says, we shall not trade this joy for all the riches in the world. Not a chance. But if we're going to be honest with ourselves, then we must acknowledge that there are times when we fall short of the standard set here in 2 Corinthians 9, especially during times of financial stress or busyness or when we're facing down a global pandemic. Even for seasoned Christians, sometimes giving is done more out of duty, not, not desire or delight, or sometimes not at all. And so let's just hold the tension about money for a moment. This is a very unpopular subject, I know that. But let's talk about money. Money can create tension between the most well-intentioned people, business executives, even church leaders. We see those tense moments at consistory meetings when if the budget is going a particular way, the emotions start to flare. Or if someone gives a generous gift to the church, there might be debate back and forth as to how that gift ought to be used. Money reveals something deeper about who we really are, doesn't it? The apostle pled with the Corinthians to provide financial aid to the Jerusalem church. They desperately needed the help. And the Corinthians promised that they would write a check to help them out. And so, in our passage for today, the apostle reveals his passion to see that they stay true to their commitment. By saying, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves not a stingy giver, but a cheerful giver. The late Richard Halverson, former chaplain of the United States Senate, once pointed out something that troubles a lot of people and excites a few. He said, Jesus Christ said more about money than any other subject in the New Testament. Because when it comes to a person's real nature, money is of first importance. Money is an exact index to a person's true character. All through scripture, he says, there's an intimate correlation between the development of a person's character and how he or she handles their money. That's a good paraphrase, I think, of Matthew 6.21. When Jesus says, your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, what your money's going after is sig signaling what your heart's going after. What money is to us shows what God is to us. But Jesus says... A person's life does not consist in the abundance of his or her possessions. No, it consists in their relationship to God. In other words, the way we go about spending our money shows where we believe life is found. How do you spend your money? If we were to open your checkbook right now, what would it tell us about your priorities and what's important to you or where you believe life is found? There are two really important passages in the New Testament and they are telling the same story but in a different way. You have to love the synoptic gospels. This is what they do. 
But in Mark 12 and Luke 21, we read the story of the widow's mite. Now I know, some of you are like, oh, I got that one down. That's, we all know this. In Mark's version, there are two coins. In Luke's, there, there's only one. Well, Jesus teaches in the temple in Jerusalem, and some scholars think that maybe he put her up to this so that it was all staged. We don't know. But at some moment, a widow comes forward and she puts in these lepta coins, according to scripture, everything that she had to her name, except the clothes on her back. And she placed the coins the treasury. And several years ago, I purchased two of these coins. I have them right here. You cannot see them because they are so small. But basically, these two coins here would be the equivalent of a quadrant, the smallest Roman coin. But this is Jewish currency, and this wouldn't even be worth a penny in today's currency. So if you go to Israel, Palestine, there's a plethora of advertisements about the widow's might. Now you too can own a genuine coin from the time of Jesus, the widow's might. It's a minor miracle that this coin even exists and now it's even more of a miracle that you can afford it. And then the ad goes on, and I love this one. While our limited supplies last, you can order the 2,000-year-old widow's might for just $39.95 plus shipping and handling. Remember this, the genuine coin is mentioned in the New Testament and it makes a perfect gift for your child, your grandchild, or your favorite pastor. It sounds like you're buying the actual coin itself. But you're, you're not buying the one the widow placed in the treasury. Harder still is to purchase the widow's attitude of generosity which is of greater value in today's market. What do you do with your money? How do you feel about giving? And when you do give, do you feel God's pleasure? Do you? There are other illustrations from the New Testament that I was able to look at for a little while because this illustration of the widow's might is really about giving with trust but Jesus offers so many more that lead up to the cheerful giver for example in Matthew 6 the Sermon on the Mount Jesus teaches his followers to give with quietness and then in Matthew 14 Jesus feeds the crowds showing Christians how to give with expectancy And then Matthew 25, the story of the sheep and the goats, which we will unpack next Sunday from this pulpit. We read, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And here in this parable, Jesus is teaching us about what it means to give with purpose. The Good Samaritan story is a teaching about giving with compassion. And then, of course, the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19. Zacchaeus was a crook. He was a criminal. He was a bad guy. But salvation came to his house that day, and we learn from that story how to give with devotion. And then there's Acts chapter 20, where it is said Jesus had told his disciples It is more blessed to give than to receive. How do you feel about money? How do you feel about giving? When you give, do you feel God's pleasure? Do you rejoice when you give back because of all that God has done for you, is doing for you, and will do for your benefit? The Apostle Paul gave a theology lesson on on giving and generosity in 2 Corinthians 9, 8 and 9. It's probably unmatched anywhere in the New Testament, except John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. 
Paul wanted their generosity to be genuine from the heart. And he wanted them to follow through on their commitment to the Christians living in Jerusalem. So that's my hope for us today, is that we will think about why we give and how we give. And when we give, if it's giving with strings attached or if it's giving in such a way so we open our hearts to the living God and feel God's pleasure every time we give something back. Nothing could be more joyful. And just like Eric Little, may we feel the pleasure of the, the, pleasure of the Lord in and through us. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you so much for this short passage that challenges us today to think about our motives and why we give. Today, may our hearts be inspired to be generous with our time, with our talent, with our treasure so that your kingdom here on earth may grow and so that lives may be transformed starting with our own. Help us, Lord. Help us to see the world the way you see it and inspire our giving in all things so we might feel your pleasure for your glory, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said.